happened and, and, and why are you telling me you can't play but you, you can clearly play so I told him my whole experience in high school and he said you just need a safe place to learn I'll make a promise with you here's the key to this room you can come here anytime and practice this is a safe space for you to learn if you make a mistake it's okay you will not be scolded or, or ridiculed or and humanize, you will be respected here as a musician, and you are more than welcome to learn because this is a place where everybody's welcome to learn. That's Camille Thurman, who is an incredible saxophonist, vocalist, composer, and educator. In our conversation, we talk about why she almost gave up music entirely, but how supportive teachers and fellow musicians brought her back, which led to playing with Wynton Marsalis and the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra not long after. I find her story inspirational, and I hope you enjoy my interview with Camille Thurman. So does anyone ever call you Camille? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> people call me Camille. When you're in France. Yeah, or when I'm in Canada. <laughs> oh, in Canada, they do as well. Okay. In Montreal. <laughs> you know, I live in France, and when I, you know, when I see your name, it just, it's hard for, I have to make an effort to say, okay, Camille. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so what I'm really interested to know about from you and really all my guests is the story of how you got to where you are today as a musician. You know, if you could tell us, you know, a bit about that, because I find those stories to be usually really inspirational and enlightening and just really interesting. So I'd love to start with that. Well, um, I would start by saying the saxophone wasn't my initial choice. Um, I started playing the flute at the age of 12, but before I even did that, I started playing in violin at the age of four. And I, I loved it. It was the best thing for me at that time because my parents had gone through a divorce and music was this thing that I was able to have fun with. And the program got canceled within a year at my school because we experienced a major budget cut in the entire district where they completely defunded the arts. So I thought, okay, I guess I'll never ever get to play violin again because my teacher wasn't there at the school and we didn't have any instruments. The next school that I went to for grade three through five, they didn't have a music program. In fact, I remember asking um, our, our teacher, Dr. Jackman, if we could you know, play music and if it's possible to get instruments. And I remember her telling us, well, we have instruments, but they're on stage backstage and they're broken and there's no funding for a teacher or for them to get fixed. And I remember my heart being crushed because I really wanted to play music again. And I didn't understand how you can have places where you can learn, but not have access to the arts. And it wasn't until I got to sixth grade that I literally get an instrument in my hands again, but it was a process because of the fact that I came from a school that did not have a music program. They wouldn't let me in the music program because I wasn't playing already. And I remember just thinking at 12, 13 years old, why can't I access taking music lessons or being part of a band? And why is it that I'm kind of almost being penalized because of my school not having a program already? And, and now that I'm at a school that has a program, I can't be part of it because I am not coming with anything. And I remember being placed in, in chorus and I, the irony is I hated being in chorus at that time. <laughs> and um, I remember talking to my teacher, Mr. Titel, and I asked him, I said, hey, I know you have a band here. Can, can I just talk to the band teacher? I really want to be in the band. I just want to be part of the band. And he was like, well, you don't play an instrument already. I was like, I understand that, but this is a school, right? So if this is school, you're supposed to learn, right? So can I learn to play an instrument? And he was just like, okay, all right, because I annoyed him every day asking. <laughs> and he wrote me a hall pass, and I went to go see Dr. Peter Archer, who was actually the inspiration behind the movie Soul. And oh. it's funny because that classroom is literally my band room from sixth grade <laughs> in the movie. And I went to knock on his door, and it was his uh, prep period, so there was nobody there but him and he said, yes, how can I help you? And I said, my name is Camille and I want to be in your band. And he's looking at me like, how is this random young student coming here asking to be part of a band? 
And he said, well, what do you play? And I said, well, I don't play anything, but I really want to learn how to play. And he was like, okay, well, you know, the school already started where we begin. And on top of that, my number is 50. So once I have 50 students, that's it. Legally, I can't take any more. And I said, but I really, really want to play an instrument. And, you know, I know you have a music program here. My other schools that I came from, we didn't have music. And I really, really want to play again. So he was willing to make me number 51. And he let me in and he said, okay, what are you going to play? And I said, I want to play trumpet. But I was just in a car accident where I had stitches in my lip. And he was like, no, you're not going to do that because I don't want your mom to be pissed at me for busting your lip again. <laughs> And he said, well, how about, you know, trombone? I was like, no, no, I'll be made fun of. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, well, we already have a lot of flutes in the flute section. I said, well, how about clarinet? And he's like, well, we already got a lot of clarinets in the clarinet section. He said, we really do need trombones. And I said, oh, okay. So I took the trombone. He gave me a book and he said, look, Class starts on this time on Mondays. Be there. Start looking at these positions or over the weekend. If you have any questions, let me know. So I took the book home and I'm trying to figure it out. And for me, you know, I, I was a petite student, so trying to get to sixth position was very problematic for me. <laughs> and I remember coming back to school and I, I started going to band with him and uh, I was hanging okay. But one day I picked up that trombone because we were assigned different periods for each instrument. And my band period was right after lunch, which was the worst period to have band. <laughs> and somebody had put a spitball in the piping of the trombone and I didn't know it. So when I put the trombone to my mouth and inhaled, it went to my lip and I screamed and dropped the trombone and ran out the classroom. <laughs> and I was like, I quit. <laughs> And he's oh, like, what no. just happened here? And I was like, a spitball came on my mouth and it grossed me out. And that's when he reluctantly gave me a flute. And <laughs> <laughs> so I started teaching myself the fingerings. And within, I would say, a month or two, I, I picked it up. I was learning the fingerings. I was, you know, figuring out the music. I had a secret, though. I was learning things by ear and I didn't realize that I had a strong ear. I was just hearing things and finding it on the instrument. So whenever we would play the music in class, I wasn't reading it. I was just playing by memory and what I heard. So one day I was playing and he was like, yeah, why don't you play such and such? And I played it. He was like, something's a little off. Play it again. And I was trying to play it. And he was like, are you reading? And I said, no, I'm just playing by my ear what I remember. <laughs> He was like, Thermy, you got to read. So, of course, he started trying to teach me how to read. And then by the end of, I would say, sixth, or se sixth grade, or maybe it was seventh grade, I got a mouthpiece from my mom. And I thought it was for clarinet. And I nagged him. I said, Mr. Archer, can I please play a clarinet? And he was like, no, Thermy, we just got you on the flute. Let's keep you there. Keep it settled. And I was like, well, I really, really, really want to play clarinet, too. And he looked at the mouthpiece and he was like, this is not a, a clarinet mouthpiece. It's actually a saxophone mouthpiece. And my eyes were just like, oh, I want to play a saxophone. And he was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but what I really appreciated about him at that time was he never discouraged me. He looked at me and he said, you know, you can make a career playing multiple woodwinds. And when he told me that it was just like, my eyes lit up because I didn't know it was even possible to have a career in music, let alone playing multiple instruments. And from that day on, I made my mind up that I was going to learn all the woodwinds in the section. And he would give me every instrument to try out and the rest is his. How old were you at this point? I had to have been about 13. All right. So that's, so that's, I, I didn't expect that story. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Uh, and that's interesting. So, what was the name of the teacher again? Dr. Peter Archer. Dr. Peter Archer, right. And he, you're telling me that he was the inspiration Behind for... Behind Right, okay. And were you the, the trombone player? Were you the inspiration? For the <laughs> no, actually, it's funny because I didn't realize what he was working on until one day I got a random call from um, John Batiste's manager. And they were like, hey, are you available to fly out to, to, to L.A. this weekend? And at the time, I was working with the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra, and we had a show scheduled that weekend. And I was like, what's what's going on? And they were like, oh, well, you know, 
um, John is filming this this movie, and your your teacher, Dr. Peter Archer, recommended you to come and you know play you know the saxophone for this 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 audio that we're, we're recording. And I was like, oh man! And at the time, I was like, I gotta give it witness. I don't think I can get out of it. <laughs> and unfortunately, I had to decline. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, but I, I wish. I wish I could have did it, but it's it's great. I'm so happy that they got Tia Bullock to do it. Yeah, that is well. When that movie came out, my daughter watched it, and she's watched that movie. I don't know how many times. And this wasn't because I was like, watch this movie. There's jazz, you know. <laughs> I didn't. It was entirely on her own. <laughs> Now that's just the beginning of your story mm -hmm. because after, I mean, there's a lot more to it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe you could kind of walk us through like from that, from 13 till, till now, cause I'm sure there's a lot more interesting bits. Yeah. Um, Dr. Archer, he, once he, he knew I was really interested in music, he called my mom and was like, okay, this is where she's going for high school. This is where she's going for college. <laughs> And my mom is like, who is this teacher <laughs> telling me what to do with my daughter? And he, he just really believed in me. And he would drop off books of etudes and all kinds of stuff during the summer break and say, hey, Fermi, learn these during the summer and I'll see you at the school year. <laughs> at the school year. And I remember he took me to a concert at LaGuardia High School. And that's where I got to see a big band for the first time in person. And it blew my mind that they were high school kids and that there were some ladies in the band, too, that I never saw before play. And I made up my mind. I was like, okay, I'm going to go to LaGuardia. And I got into LaGuardia and I graduated from there. During my time there, it was great because I had um, a wonderful teacher by the name of Bob Stewart, who's a phenomenal educator and a tubist. And my first two years, I had him. The last two years, he um, ended up teaching at Juilliard and we ended up having a shift in the program. And it was a challenge because for myself and some young ladies, it was like Bob Stewart, he kept the level of respect and um, inclusivity for everybody. And he left, everything went upside down. And we started really dealing with sexism. I did not know what it was. I did not know what the name of it was. I just knew it was something that was feeling that was different. And my last two years was really, really, really difficult because um, for us ladies, we were excluded from participating and in, in, in playing and to, much, to the point where I remember there was another tenor player. We would sit there, me and her would just stand there for like 40 minutes to play because we would rotate chairs in order to, to play since there was like seven of us on the saxophone section. And we would wait literally till like almost the end of the period for an opportunity to play. The guys would be like, oh, I don't feel like playing this piece. You could play it. And me and her would have to learn both books for every song just in case if one of them decided to have us on a chart because the teacher at the time left it to us to decide amongst ourselves which was the worst decision and i just remember when i graduated i was so discouraged from playing because i had such a opposite experience from my my development and and being in a situation where you're told in your face we don't want you here we want our buddy here because we think he's better than you and we just want him here it was rough so by the time I graduated, I was like, I'm done with music. If this is how it's going to be, I don't even want to do it. And um, I took a semester off. I ended up going away to Binghamton University, I think about a year later. And the randomest thing was the music teacher who ran the jazz band, he found out I was coming from New York City and he knew I played. And he was like, I saw it on your transcript. You went to the specialized high school so you could play. I was like, no, you don't want me. I'm the worst person you could ever have in your band. And he was like, why would you say that? I was like, well, because that's what has been told to myself and other, the other ladies for so long. We were just like, okay, fine. I guess because we're not playing, that's why. And he was kind of looking at me kind of weird, like, why would you think that? And I remember he encouraged me to come and take an audition for the jazz band. And I remember sitting on my dorm bed contemplating if I should go or not because I was stuck in like the PTSD of what I experienced in high school that I couldn't move and I missed the audition. And the next day he saw me on campus and he was like, I was looking for you. Why didn't you come? 
And I was like, I, I couldn't do it. Just from the trauma that I dealt with, I just didn't feel like I would I could be there. Or I, I would be a good fit. And he was like, well, let's get your feet wet. Take an improv class with me. So I signed up. And I remember we were going down the line and he was playing an Abersol blues and we all were taking the course. And he had his back to us, was trying to wrap up some ad- admin paperwork. And I remember when I went to play, the instant my sound came out my horn, he dropped his papers. And he turned around and looked at me and was like, why is this young lady saying she can't play? And she has like this sound. <laughs> so <laughs> he had after class, everybody left. And he pulled me aside and he was like, okay, we need to talk. What's, what's, what happened? And, and, and why are you telling me you can't play, but you, you can clearly play? So I told him my whole experience in high school. And he said, you just need a safe place to learn. The reason why you feel the way you do is because you were in an environment where it wasn't encouraged and safe for you and the ladies to learn. And it felt like that because if we were to make a mistake, it, was, it felt like the world was on our shoulders that we couldn't make a mistake because we would immediately be torn apart by the, our peers in the band. And nobody at the time stood up for us to say, hey, no, if you made a mistake, they can make a mistake too. So he said, look, I'll make a promise with you. Here's the key to this room. You can come here anytime and practice. I guarantee and promise that this is a safe space for you to learn. If you make a mistake, it's okay. You will not be scolded or, or ridiculed or, or humanized. You will be respected here as a musician and you are more than welcome to learn because this is a place where everybody's welcome to learn. And my heart just sank because like the last two years of school was just not that experience for me. And I just grew. <laughs> um, he he let, put me on his gigs. He had me play in every and any situation that needed a saxophone player. And I just grew so much. And that's where he kind of introduced me to Tia Fuller and that was the first person I met who was a woman that played professionally and was like, hey, I'm doing this. You could totally have a career in this, which just blew my mind because I was like, wait a minute. You play really good. The guys respect you as a person and as a player. And you're making a career off of this where I don't see any other women doing this. And after that, I called my parents. I told them, I said, hey, mom and dad, I'm coming back to New York City, but I'm not going to be a teacher. I'm going to be a professional musician (laughs) and they flipped being teachers thinking, Oh my gosh, this is going to be the the end. And (laughs) I'm glad I did it because once I graduated, I I created a, I, I had a family, a musical family of Tia and Amy Jones and, um, Antoine Roney and Bruce Williams and Abraham Burton, Bill Saxon and George Coleman and so many other musicians that literally just took me under their wing and taught me because they believed in me and were like, look, We want you to be out here because we know you can do it and we believe in you. And they just poured into me their, their time and, and anything, even if it was just coming to their house to hang out, it turned into a lesson. (laughs) Or even if it was like giving me a meal and like, okay, let's look, let's check out this recording. And they really just helped me get myself together once I got out of college and the rest was history, whether it was subbing for people's gigs or, um, networking with different musicians, each of them gave me a chance to play with Charlie Persip or to play with Valerie Panamara or even just um, taking over a gig that they weren't going to do anymore. And through that, I just started kind of just really playing and doing the best that I could. And somehow that ended up leading me to jazz at Lincoln Center and meeting and, pl- and playing with Wenton and the rest is history. <laughs> I said uh, I love hearing people's stories because they're inspirational. That's that <laughs> is a very good example, and it brings up some you know lots of other things. But you know one one thing I wanted to ask you about is what it's like 
for women today in the music business. And, uh, and it's interesting because there are, because <laughs> you, you told us about two completely different experiences. One, where you're a student, you're a young person, you're encouraged, and what can happen when, when you have those circumstances. And then the other one, which is the, the polar opposite, where you're discouraged and it's almost like, uh, you know, we'd rather not have you for whatever reason, uh, you know, in this case, gender, but and how that can make you just never want to play music again. Yeah. And it's like the, you know, you have the, the, the extreme in both directions and you're certainly not the only person to experience, to have, you know, the, that negative experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know, you know, I've known lots of women musicians, uh, and especially in school. And I remember people telling me the similar sort of situations, like I, I'm giving up because yeah. it's just not fun. It's it's horrible and it's because of this person and this person and the way we're treated here and that. Yeah. And it's true. I mean, that's something that, you know, men, I've never heard a, a man tell me the same, <laughs> the same story. Like uh, I'm giving up music because I'm, you know, because it's just too, it's people are making it too difficult for me. So, uh, if you could talk about that, because your story is really inspiring, I'm sure to lots of other young ladies who would like to get into music, or especially anyone who maybe had similar experiences to you. Yeah. Well, I think the biggest thing for me at that time was being in a space where there wasn't support at the years that I really needed it, at 13, 14, and 15. And I've, I've gotten into conversations about this with educators and musicians about how young ladies will start off in middle school and they might continue in, in, in um, high school. And a lot of times it tapers off. And by the time they get to college, it's probably a few. A big part of it is representation and seeing it reflected in the industry. And the irony is that it, it's getting better now, but at least when I was coming up as a kid, I don't remember seeing posters around the band room of, of women musicians, particularly jazz musicians. And I didn't know they existed until I was 22 when I got to meet one in, a per in person, in the flesh. And I think it's critical in, in, in having or creating spaces where we can have that representation seen because believe it or not, it's reflected in the education world too. If, if, if you have young students and you're teaching them this music, they got to have something tangible that they can see and be able to hear and, and know exists. Um, what was interesting about the time when I joined the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra, we had streaming. And it was really huge because it was like, wow, you could see a concert from thousands of miles away happening. And I remember so many teachers and young women would email me or shoot me a message via Instagram or, um, or Facebook or Twitter saying, oh my gosh, you exist. <laughs> you actually are a person. And the impact of like, wow, to see something and know that it exists because it's accessible is huge. So if there's a way of creating more opportunity where you have women being represented on a high level and being seen and being heard and it being consistent, and then also opportunities where you see them in different facets of the industry, whether it's up front as a soloist or in the mix as, as, as a, um, a collective band member or as a composer or as uh, someone in the business, it, it gives that inspiration to people of being able to say, I see it, therefore I know it exists and that it's possible. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting that this is just occurring to me now. You're talking about being this having streaming and having people be able to see it and maybe that has a certain responsibility in things improving and getting better because now exactly. someone like you can be seen all over the world and and that message gets out to people because they can see it on the internet and before that it was yeah it was very much a, a gated situation and we didn't get to see everything we only got to really see what was chosen to be put in front of us right so 
Thank you, Internet. <laughs> 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 it's no, but it's it's certainly true that it's improved, but it's still far from where it should be naturally because music is not a you know music is not like something that men are better at than women but you see in in everything you know there's just so many fewer women in that industry um and it really it probably should just be split well, if everything else is equal <laughs> yeah i mean the irony of it is that they exist it's just a matter of the opportunity to be uh, having that exposure because yeah. it's it's funny when I first came out of college, that was the first time I got to see in person. Whoa, there's women musicians on the scene, and then getting to talk with my mentors and, and hearing about the history of all the women that were on the scene 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago, and the impact that they had on the musicians that we know about, like Mary Lou Williams and Thelonious Monk, or um, Blanche Calloway and Cap Calloway, you start to kind of see, like, wait a minute, why was not, why wasn't this information put in a place where it was accessible? And now, thank goodness, of course, because of the internet and because of people's interests, now we're starting to really dig and, and, and put the information out there in a place where it's accessible, whereas before, Maybe it was buried or it just wasn't even recorded or it wasn't um, put in a place where everybody can go and find it. It's great now that we can find it, but um, creating those spaces where the representation can be accessed, right. I mean, it's, it's critical. Right. It probably wasn't considered marketable enough at the time. And, and that's why, you know, that is a big determining factor in what everyone saw before the sort of the the democratization of everything with the internet right. uh, you have a program that you're involved with called the Haven Hang. Could you tell us about that? Sure. So during the pandemic, um, I, along with everybody else who are musicians, were sitting at home and just feeling like, man, it'd be great to create and to interact with people because that's the one principal thing that we do when we play. And it was kind of rough not being able to interact with people. And I was thinking, I had this wish of wanting to create something for young women musicians because I was getting messages through my social media and even through my email um, about questions that I had when I was 13, 14, 15. It was kind of blowing my mind like, wow, here we are 15, 20 years later and young ladies still have these questions. Except at my time, we didn't have the internet and what well, we did, but not like today. <laughs> um, I didn't know how to access it or, or even who to ask, but Today, I was thinking maybe there's a way to create some type of connection or a platform where they can ask these questions and get answers, but most importantly, hear it directly from these women that are out here. So I talked with my best friend, Uni Mojica, and I, I was like, I think I have this idea, but I don't know if, if it's even you know something I should do. And I told her, and she was like, do it, just do it. And then, of course, there's a thought of like, well, who am I? I mean, I'm one of many women, you know, to do this. And she was like, do it because your story needs to be heard so that other people can understand that their story, but that one, they're not alone. And two, that this is not something that doesn't exist, that it does exist. So the Haven Hang came to be a, a thing where I wanted to create a, a virtual space where women can ask questions from any age and from any um, aspect of their career, whether they're beginners or they're just getting out of college and starting to embark on it, or to even women who are already doing it too, to create uh, a place where we can come and ask those questions, but also hear and receive wisdom from the women who have already doing it. And the primary focus was to focus on personal development, because a lot of times we see the success stories of women who made it, but as far as the process of what you had to do to be able to get to the place of making those decisions and committing yourself to making it, that story doesn't quite get amplified. So 
I called some of my mentors and some of my closest friends and I said, hey, would you mind donating maybe 45 minutes to 60 minutes of your time where we could just talk about how you developed as a person? How did you develop confidence? Um, how did you deal with discouragement? How did you do it practicing? And how did you deal with getting in places where you're the only lady? Let's just talk about those things. And they were excited because they were like, yeah, let's, let's do that. Cause we're not really having any conversations. And the first episode started with me just sending out a post saying, Hey, I'm going to do this series. If you have any questions, they can be anonymous, shoot them to me. We had questions from all over the world, from Australia, South Africa, Europe, you name it. And the first session was just me going through all these questions that were asked and just giving my personal advice on dealing and navigating with these things, whether it was how to practice or how to deal with developing confidence or, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm in high school and I really want to play, but I don't see any, I don't know any other musicians that are doing this as a career because you give me some um, names to check out and, and study or explore or, okay, how do you deal with the situation where you, you're being told that you're a, a great player, but you're not being included because of whatever, or how do you deal with the situation where you have a teacher who's not supportive and, it just grew and ended up becoming 15 episodes. And I featured people like Dee Dee Bridgewater, um, Maxine Gordon, who is a wonderful archivist and the wife of Dexter Gordon, um, Crystal Torres, who's a trumpeter from Beyonce's band, to even other women in, in different aspects of the arts, like Mia Love, who's a phenomenal choreographer and uh, activists and poets. And it became a thing during the pandemic where people would come and watch, even men would watch it too because it became insightful for them to hear our experiences and our stories and understanding the process mentally of how we navigate these these things on our journey of becoming who we are and even for teachers i've had teachers email me like thank you so much i did not know my young ladies are going through this at the age of 13 14 so it's, it's been a great thing and now since the pandemic is over i make visits to colleges and universities and schools and do, do lectures and um, conferences and discussions where we get to have a haven hang and, and create a bigger space where we could do this in person. Okay. Well, that's amazing. That's fantastic. And I'm sure you've uh, reached a lot of people with that program in a very positive way. So that's always a, that's always a good thing to pay it forward. Yeah. Uh, now you, in addition to being an amazing saxophone player, uh, I know you're also an amazing singer, <laughs> and and I'm sure you do lots of other things amazingly. But um, could you talk to us about what that's like? Because most, yeah, I mean, lots of musicians are also singers, but lots aren't. And mm -hmm. as the saxophone is a very vocal instrument i don't know maybe you could just talk about how, what came first was it singing first and then saxophone or are when you're thinking what's the thought process as a saxophone player that's also like a singer who improvises and you know all of those things it's like what came first the chicken or the egg <laughs> <laughs> um i was singing since i was four years old my mother she sung and played piano so whenever she was in the church conducting children's choir, I was right next to her, learning all these parts by ear. Um, when I got to school, I would say to high school, I fell in love with Sarah Vaughn. It was like my, my biggest inspiration. And I would put her records on and jump on a bed and pretend that I was <laughs> singing along to these records and learning all the solos without realizing I was transcribing. And then... I started kind of figuring out how, well, if I could sing it, let me see if I could find it on my instrument. And of course that was rough in the beginning because singing is not like pushing buttons and you could feel things and phrases and you got to figure out how to teach yourself that on with respect to the instrument itself. Mm -hmm. And I would just kind of go back and forth doing it. I was kind of shy about singing because my first, one of my earliest encounters as, as, as a young, young instrumentalist was being told, oh, you're the vocalist, right? Even though I'm holding my instrument. And I remember feeling like, wait a minute, is there some type of 
social thing where people see a lady and they think she's the vocalist. Can you be a good musician? Can you be an actual musician and be a lady? I mean, it was perplexing to me at 13, 14 years old. And I was just like, this is weird. So I'm thinking the complete opposite. Like, well, maybe if I just don't tell people I sing and I just try to be really, really, really good, maybe they can accept me being a player. And I kept uh-huh. it a secret. And it wasn't until college where I was encouraged by um, uh, Michael Carbone and Antoine Roney and, and Mimi Jones to sing. And that's when they taught me, hey, there's a whole lineage of musicians who are vocalists and instrumentalists, Ray Charles, um, Aretha Franklin, uh, Shirley Horn, Louis Jordan, and the list goes on and on. I mean, of course, Louis Armstrong, Gladys Snow, and as they started telling me this, I started realizing, man, realizing, man, what was I thinking? Why did I keep this a secret? Maybe I could give it a try. And in the beginning, it was difficult because during that time earlier in my career, there weren't really a lot of young people who were singing and playing. Um, a couple of years later, you had Esperance Spalding, but there still was kind of this notion of when you see a woman, you didn't really expect her to do both. And then even on the industry side, when it came time to working with promoters or working with agents, it was kind of like, okay, so are you a singer who plays or are you a player who sings? And I just felt like, well, why can't I just be? (laughs) I I am a player and a a vocalist. And this is my package. Just like if you were to walk around and breathe, you're a human being living and breathing. And this is, this is me music, musically speaking. But, um, I encourage you know young people when I meet them to, to do both because you learn so much about your instrument in terms of what it's capable of doing, but also outside of the barriers of what it's supposed to do. And you know, as a vocalist, getting inspiration from hearing horn lines gives you so many possibilities in terms of phrasing and, 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 and uh, executing the lines and the vice versa as a horn player when you hear a singer, it gives you so many ideas about color, timbre, texture, um, how you shape your lines. And it, it makes you just have so much insight and in understanding the language of the music rather than just the mechanics of it. Yeah, I think singing, certainly for a lot of instrumentalists, maybe not so much piano players, guitar players, but you know, saxophone players, you, when you can't do both at the same time, there is a certain limitation yeah. there that you don't have a piano or guitar or an instrument like that. But yeah, when you're singing, you're doing so many more things that you might not necessarily do with a saxophone, like yeah. direct, really direct communication with your, your listeners because you're singing words to them. And it, you know, that's just, it's a bit more direct. Um, and then also just l- really learning those melodies and all those things as a singer does. Exactly. Which is not quite the same as horn players. Yeah, because we just push the button and go, but we miss out on the story of the melody. And yeah. how there's so much information in that melody that you could use to create expression, which is why we do what we do <laughs> as musicians and yeah. express ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, I love that tradition which seems to be somewhat older of like you know the singer singing songs and playing them you know Mm -hmm. before uh jazz became more primarily instrumental so yeah yeah, bring that back as much as possible i love all of that yeah Now, I know you're doing a lot of teaching as well. Mm -hmm. Where is it that you're teaching primarily? Well, currently I'm teaching at McGill University. Um, And of course, I do clinics and master classes and lectures all over the world, um, vocally and on the saxophone and with with ensembles. And then I also tour and perform with my own band, Camille Thurman with the Derrick Bain Quartet. So 
it's a juggling of the three. <laughs> Lots of things, I know. So yeah. maybe what I always like to ask people about is like one thing that you work on with your students that you find to be really effective. Ooh, <clears throat> the foundation, air support. 99% of the problems that we have with our instrument is because we're not giving it the right support in terms of air. Um, posture, I'm sure. That's like a th fundamentals when it comes to producing sound because you can have all of this, but if you don't have a good air or a good um, uh, embouchure development, your sound is going to be weak. And sound is the first thing that we identify. That's our voice. So if you can't even establish that, everything else that you're going to try to do is not going to have anything to carry it because you have no sound, you have no air. So I spend a lot of time working on that with the students. Um, I also work on talking about the language of this music because many times when we teach improvisation, we talk about the, the scales, the chords, the sounds that work but we don't talk about function at all. And I remember um, great Antoine Roney who told me, he's like, you know, the number one thing we're dealing with language and jazz is the rhythm. You can learn all that stuff, but if you don't understand the context in terms of the conversational aspect of the rhythm, what are you gonna play that's gonna be, have any meaning? And I focus a lot on that with my students, listening for the, the, the rhythmic conversation. Of, of, of the lines. When we're transcribing, don't just transcribe just for the sake of getting all the notes under your fingers and then leaving it alone. Do a deeper dig into seeing what's happening with the rhythm, the conversation in that. Looking at Bird, looking at Stitt, looking at Dexter, looking at Train. There's so much information <laughs> that you miss out on if you're not even just looking at that layer of it. And then, okay, let's look at the harmonic aspect and the melodic aspect of the conversation. And then don't just leave it at that. Dig deep and see what's happening with the phrasing, what's happening with the inflection. Um, how do we distinguish the line from you just reading it and playing it to you actually listening to the recording and really trying to match the intensity of what they're saying? Is it a statement? Is it a question? What's the function of it? How does it make you feel? Okay, can you recreate that in your own way? How does that feel for you? What do you can you hear what, what you're playing and, 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 and hear the intention of, are you playing a question or are you playing an answer? Or are you mm. playing a question and are you giving it space for somebody else to be able to, to answer off of? Those kind of fundamental things I spend a lot of time working on with my students. And I, I just believe that if you're going to be a great player of this music, you got to be a great communicator and a great listener. And that's where it starts. I really love that. Uh, is this a question or is this an answer? And there's so many implications for that in a way of, you know, as a way of listening and identifying phrases and, you know, what does that mean to you? Yeah. It's that, that's a really interesting way. And then, okay, when you're playing, are you playing a question or are you playing an answer? And, and something else to think about. Just putting things, just taking musical things and putting them into contexts that are more familiar it's interesting how yeah it's a very simple thing can change the way people think about about making music huh yeah um, fantastic well camille thank you so much for this this was a wonderful conversation and i really enjoyed hearing your story and uh i really appreciate that I didn't. I I wasn't expecting you to 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 talk about that. You know the the adversity. You know sometimes it, I've had a bunch of uh, interviews lately, and that's kind of been a theme in a few where people were talking about. You know it was you know it was it was challenging for me for this reason or that other reason, and I've it's it's made me think that um, I feel as though when. Often when something is, when someone tells you you can't do something, that makes you want to do it that much more. Yeah. And it's almost like, it's almost like, well, you know, if they hadn't told me I couldn't do this, then maybe I wouldn't have had to show them so much, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it's a, a blessing in disguise, as they say, sometimes. Who knows? Yeah. And it, it makes you stronger and it makes you really get to the center of why you do it and who you're doing it for. 
which in the long run, if you're thinking about making a career with longevity, those those things really matter. <laughs> Well, you know, one more thing before we wrap it up, then uh, I would love to know your advice to other young women thinking about getting into music or a career in music, or even if it's just studying music and taking it seriously. First thing, find a mentor. Um, you you got to find somebody that you, you see yourself in. Um, for me, that person was Dexter Gordon. Okay, he wasn't a lady. But there was something inside of him that I, I wanted for myself that I know I needed. He played with that confidence and that wit and humor and freedom that at that time, at 13 years old, I was figuring that out for myself and struggling with being able to step up and do those things. Um, if you could find somebody that you, you could see yourself or identify yourself with, it helps so much because especially when you have those low moments where you don't feel your best or you're not getting support or you're not feeling like um, it's working. You have those people to listen to for inspiration, to remind you why you're doing this, the fact that you love it or mm. oh, I gotta figure that out still, even though I feel like crap right now, I, I still got to figure out what he did or she did. That's, that's the main thing to have. And then reach out to people. If you can, we're in the age of accessibility whether it's shooting an email or a message or a DM, um, reach out to people, ask that question that you have. You, you never know, they might respond or okay, it might take a second to respond, but one day you might see that question answered on your, your inbox. We're that close to each other. We're really not that far away from each other, especially in today's world. So seek out those, those, those answers to those questions. And then keep yourself in a space where you have people who are encouraging and rooting for you, because those are the people that are going to help give you perspective, particularly those mentors. When you have those moments of uncertainty, um, I know I sure had lots of moments of like, okay, I know there's no answer in a book about this because this is uncharted territory. And having those people to talk to help give me the wisdom to make those decisions and, and, and figuring out, okay, I think this is what's best for me. So this is a decision I'm going to make. Having those resources around you is critical and have fun. I have lots of fun doing it. It's interesting. you say, yeah, have a mentor. And I was going to say, well, that's, it's not always that easy to get mentors, but you're like, yeah, but mentors don't have to be a physical person. Exactly. Still alive. <laughs> it can be, be a record. <laughs> it could be a photo of somebody. It could be hmm. words. And you know, it doesn't necessarily even have to be in your field. It could be somebody in another field that you identify with. All right. Wow. All right. Well, thanks so much for this. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.